What's going on guys, the Comics Kid 2099 here to examine an issue of the X-Men. Today, I'm examining X-Men Annual 3. I was supposed to cover this like after the conclusion of the arcade storyline, and I completely forgot. Uh, and then I was looking through my notes, and I realized I have an annual that I haven't covered. Uh, this issue is brought to you by these people. Uh, the only person in this creative team we have not seen uh, in this series is George Perez, uh, who uh, I think we will see some more of his work in some of the other annuals, if I'm not mistaken. Taken, but he's mostly well known uh, for his work at DC, uh, like Crisis on Infinite Earths and Teen Titans. Uh, but he did do uh, a little bit at Marvel, uh, some Fantastic Four before this. Uh, but uh, this issue, uh, like most of the annuals, is kind of a standalone thing. Uh, I will be honest, uh, in the uh, Bronze Age X-Men, I've never been a huge fan of the annuals. Uh, way back when I was uh, reading through uh, this series the first time, I would be on a roll. I would be thoroughly enjoying myself. Uh, you'd be building up a sense of momentum. Uh, this issue uh, will resolve most of the subplots from the previous issue, but there will be one or two uh, dangling things that will be left uh, for the next issue, and it will kind of keep doing that. Uh, this uh, run, uh, the Claremont era, is kind of considered to be uh, a soap opera in the best way possible. I've seen a lot of people refer to uh, this era of the X-Men kind of as a soap opera, where uh, you see all these uh, plot points that will kind of build on each other and lead to other plot points that will be build on themselves, and so so uh, you will have this momentum going and then uh, you hit a brick wall because now you've got an annual and the annual will reference some of the continuity of the ongoing issues but mostly it exists to draw in people who aren't reading the main series so in this issue uh, Banshee does reference that he uh, lost his powers uh, I mentioned last week that I didn't think we were going to see Banshee uh, say that again uh, but here he says it once again uh, but for the most part uh, this feels like it could take place anytime uh, they do reference a couple times that uh, this does take place before uh, Cyclops finds out uh, that Jean is still alive, uh, but this really feels like uh, it's an out-of-time issue. Uh, and so uh, if you are reading uh, the main series and then you get to this issue, uh, it kind of takes you out of what you have been enjoying with the main series, at least for me. Uh, now, if this was uh, the 1960s uh, and you had a whole bunch of standalone issues and then you had an annual, uh, then I might could understand why you would want an annual. It's a little longer than a normal issue, and so it feels more like a treat uh, than a normal issue. But even then, if most of your issues are standalone, I don't really understand why you would want to have an annual that's also a standalone story. Uh, if you want 13 issues in a year, then just say, hey, in the month of April, we're going to do two issues. We're going to have uh, 128 and then 129 in the same month. Uh, now, I know there are people out there who don't like it when a series double ships like that. Uh, it really hits them in the pocketbook. I understand that. But if a uh, series is going to do an annual like this, it just comes out of nowhere. Uh, if you wanted to just have Archon show up in an issue of X-Men, then just have Archon show up in between the Arcade storyline and the Proteus storyline, if you wanted to do that. Uh, so this issue, it won't take me long to talk about it. Basically, we have a Threes Company misunderstanding here. Uh, Archon, who has shown up a couple times in the Avengers, uh, he shows up. He needs to find Thor. Uh, Thor is no longer a member of the Avengers. Uh, Jarvis tells Archon they can't even contact Thor. Uh, and then uh, the Grand Vizier from Archon's home world, uh, he tells Tells Archon, there's someone else who can help you. And I have no idea how the Grand Vizier knows that, uh, but then Archon is heading to the X-Mansion. And then we get a very drawn-out Danger Room shenanigan, uh, where Storm uh, is uh, briefly kind of panics because the Danger Room uh, is attacking her, and then uh, she kind of uh, puts the Danger Room on the fritz, and then uh, everybody is in danger. It goes on way too long, and I think if this was a normal issue in the series, uh, they would have wrapped up this little uh, hoo-ha a lot sooner than they did in this issue. Uh, and Storm later tells Cyclops that she's basically tired of being an X-Man, that all they do is fight. Uh, when she lived in Kenya, she used to be able to use her powers to help people, uh, and she doesn't feel like she does that anymore. Uh, I think if you went back and looked at some of the previous X-Men adventures, you could probably uh, counterpoint Storm a little bit and say, what about all these times that you used 
your powers to help people and save the world. Uh, but she doesn't feel like she's really doing much good as an X-Man. Uh, and then Archon, he finally kidnaps Storm, uh, teleports her to another world in another dimension, I guess. Uh, in this world, they do not have a sun uh, that powers their planet. Instead, they have an energy ring that surrounds their planet. And uh, apparently in an issue of the Avengers, that energy ring was starting to go out. So Iron Man built a machine that would keep the energy ring going. And now the machine uh, has started to power down. And so Archon needs to kidnap Storm so that she can repower the machine. Uh, and everyone on Archon's world knows that Storm will die doing this. And uh, Archon doesn't come off looking great in this issue. At the end, uh, the issue kind of makes it seem like, oh, Archon and those other people from that world who tried to kill Storm, aren't they just rascals? But uh, I don't really like these guys. Uh, you're kind of getting a the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few situation here, except that Spock didn't take Scotty and throw him into the warp core room and lock the door and tell him to fix the thing. Uh, yes, an entire planet is at stake, and so Archon is probably thinking it's better that one person die than our entire planet, but he's not really giving Storm a choice. He kidnaps her and says, you're going to help us. And Storm is willing to do it. Uh, again, tying in with uh, her telling Cyclops that she doesn't feel like she does much good. She's willing to help these people. But still, Archon doesn't really come off looking great here. Uh, unfortunately, I do think we are going to see Archon again in one of the later annuals. Uh, he doesn't show up that often in the Marvel Universe. Uh, I seem to recall he showed up in the uh, Avengers JLA uh, storyline by uh, Kurt Busiek and uh, George Perez. Uh, maybe George Perez just likes drawing Archon. I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, when the X-Men finally figure out what Archon is up to and why he kidnapped Storm, uh, Cyclops has a plan that uh, Colossus is going to hold Storm in the air. She is going to zap Cyclops with her powers and somehow that will recharge Cyclops and then he will blast the machine uh, and that will turn the energy rings back on. Uh, there's a whole lot of weird stuff here. Uh, Colossus apparently needs to hold uh, Storm in the air to ground her so that she won't waste any of her electricity even though uh, as far as I know when she uses her powers uh, she's not wasting electricity anyway uh, and uh, as far as I know we have never seen Storm be able to recharge Cyclops by blasting him with lightning. Uh, Cyclops is charged by the sun. Uh, he even says that in this issue because Archon's world does not have a sun. Uh, Cyclops is starting to lose uh, energy. Uh, he's uh, starting to become exhausted by doing his optic blast, which uh, is it does make sense uh, because uh, if this guy is constantly able to shoot energy from his eyes, that energy has to come from somewhere. Uh, and even if he's outside in the sun for six hours a day, with the amount of optic blast that he uses, it makes sense that eventually he would lose his charge. Uh, but it does not make sense that lightning would recharge Cyclops. Cyclops. It makes more sense that uh, he would die from getting hit by a continuous lightning bolt. Uh, and it also doesn't make sense that this machine uh, that is apparently powered by electricity, because Archon wanted Thor and then later wanted Storm to repower the machine, that somehow uh, it can be powered by force bolts. Uh, that would be like driving a truck into this machine and repowering it, because Cyclops blasts are not energy blasts, they are force beams. Uh, they push something with force. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of reasons that this is completely nonsense, but uh, Cyclops is able to turn the machines on and then everybody's happy with each other. It's kumbaya and then the X-Men go back home. Uh, I didn't really care for this issue. Uh, the writing is fine, the art is good, uh, but the plot is just kind of nonsense. I feel like the plot could have lasted 10 issue, or ten pages if Archon had just come in and said, hey, I need some help. Uh, but Archon uh, acts like his justification for that is, uh, it's not our way to ask for help. So it's totally okay that I kidnapped this woman and tried to get her to kill herself. Uh, so yeah, not a big fan of Archon, not really a fan of this story. Uh, maybe the next annual will be better, but I have a feeling I won't enjoy it either. Uh, because I'm just not a big fan of the annuals. I would prefer uh, to just keep going uh, with the momentum that you're building up in the main issues. Uh, so with that being said, let's consider this issue examined.